The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. What's the smallest space that you've ever squeezed into? Did you ever get trapped in this space? Did you feel comfortable being in there? I want you to think about that while I tell you this story, because this mystery man that you're looking at right now stirred up quite the controversy in Japan. Many people to this day don't really know why he chose to squeeze into such a small space. His name is Nayuki Kano, and the small space that he successfully infiltrated was a women's public toilet specifically the septic tank. The story begins in 1989, when a 23-year-old female elementary school teacher in Fukushima, Japan, found a male body under the toilet in the dormitory. While she was using the bathroom, she noticed that there was a shoe floating in the septic tank, and being concerned about that, she called the police, and once they drained the septic tank, they found Nayuki. This completely startled the 23-year-old teacher, not only because there was a dead body in the toilet, but she knew this man, they were friends. And even before the investigation had officially began, many people were questioning how they were even going to recover the body. He was completely wedged inside of the septic tank, and if you take a look at the diagram, there is no way out. Once you crawl inside, you stay inside. Once they cracked open the septic tank and took his body out, the police and coroner realized that he'd been dead for two days. And what killed him might shock you. It wasn't suffocation, and it wasn't drowning or poisoning from all of the waste that was surrounding him. Instead of all of that, he actually died of hypothermia. He spent well over a day in a semi-solid cold fluid, and with no realistic way to get out, the septic tank and its contents completely sapped his body of all heat and energy. Nayuki specifically died on February 28th of 1989, and police officers were still figuring out why he was in there, and whether or not it was suicide or voyeurism, or maybe even the combination of both. The police quickly noted that this septic tank wasn't a random one. It was specifically a toilet that the 23-year-old school teacher would visit. The toilet itself wasn't particularly special. It was just a habit for her, and it seemed like Naoki picked up on this pattern and decided to crawl into that particular septic tank. So I'm sure many of you are asking, how in the world did he get into the septic tank? Well, he took off his shirt, squeezed into a sewage pipe around the U-bend, and laid down vertically, knees tucked to his chest, with his head centered under the opening of the toilet. The cause of death was hypothermia, but there were other abrasions to his body. He was covered in scrapes and cuts from squeezing himself through the sewage pipe and cramming himself inside of the septic tank. Had he not died of hypothermia, he would have developed serious skin and blood infections from being submerged in human waste. With the true motive being unknown, police officers were left to figure out who Naoki was. He was 26 years old, and he was a local elementary school teacher, and that's how he became friends with the 23-year-old woman, and what may have encouraged him to crawl into her septic tank. And the oddest thing is that he wasn't your stereotypical creep. He was an excellent teacher and had an excellent reputation in the area. He was a cheerful person, and everyone wanted to be friends with him. He was humorous, kind, and sociable. His hobbies were music and sports, and people wanted to be friends with him. They wanted to be around him, and it came as an insane shock to them that this person, who was incredibly boisterous and popular, was found dead inside of a septic tank, covered in scratches and cuts, shirtless, and facing up. It's December 21st, 1988, and it's a calm winter day in Lockerbie, Scotland. For many, the day was unassuming, just like any other. You see, nobody in the town of Lockerbie that day anticipated having their lives change, their values questioned, and their sensibilities challenged. 
because on December 21st, 1988, it would begin to rain in Lockerbie. Not with rainwater, but with the fragmented parts of a Boeing 747. Pan Am Flight 103 was a regularly scheduled Pan American transatlantic flight from Frankfurt, Germany to Detroit with a stopover in London and another in New York City. It arrived at Heathrow Terminal 3 on the 21st and everything was going smoothly. Passengers and their luggage was being stowed onto the plane, the plane was completely refueled, and pilots were in preparation to take off. Little did anyone know that while during all of these normal procedures to prepare for the plane's flight, one piece of additional luggage was placed onto the plane. It was an extra suitcase that looked normal. Even the way that it was packed seemed normal. Little did anyone know that it was all a ruse. You see, the suitcase was actually filled with plastic explosives. And the suitcase was on a timer and set to explode around the time the plane would be at maximum altitude. That was the moment that most radio towers lost contact with the plane, and that's where most resources on this topic start using the word disintegration, because that's exactly what happened. The explosion punched a 50 centimeter or 20 inch hole in the left side of the fuselage. Investigators from the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration concluded that no emergency procedures had been started in the cockpit. The CVR located in the tail section of the aircraft was found in a field by police searchers within 24 hours. No distress call was recorded, no radio communications were ever made. You see, the explosion was pretty precise. It was large enough to let in just enough air for the entire plane to depressurize and disintegrate. Everyone in that plane died. While the plane did fragment in the sky and completely disintegrate, the pieces were still incredibly large. The fuselage would be one of the more notable pieces that would be falling out of the sky. While it was rapidly descending, it was still fragmenting, scattering its pieces across multiple neighborhoods in Lockerbie. And once the smoke cleared and all of the casualties were counted, all 243 passengers and 16 crew members were killed instantly, as well as 11 residents of Lockerbie who were on the ground. They were struck by plane pieces. So who was responsible? Why was this done? Well, like most plane bombings, it was political. Quickly, once the German, UK, and US governments found out that many of their citizens were blown up in the sky, one political organization quickly claimed responsibility. It was the PLL, or the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And not only did they claim responsibility, but they also mentioned how they warned multiple European nations that they were planning on doing this. Many European governments and airlines thought they were just empty threats, but no, unfortunately they weren't and the motivations behind this was to hopefully encourage European nations and the US government to support and acknowledge that Palestine was a legitimate country. Instead, what happened next was a combination effort between the CIA and MI6 to find everyone who was responsible. During their joint investigation, they also found out that this wasn't just a political attack, but a religious one as well, because since it happened a little bit before Christmas, the PLO desired to spoil the holiday whether that be with news of a destructive bombing, or worse, the tragic loss of a family member. The technology that went into the bomb wasn't too complex, but the logistics to get it onto the plane was, and the plans and people involved cost a lot of money. So who funded all of this? Well, it was the current Libyan president at the time, Muammar Gaddafi. Not only did he join in on taking responsibility for the bombing, he also made it publicly clear that he funded and supported it. Was it because he was a supporter of the PLO's politics? Not really. It just so happened that they were attacking nations who he was economically and ideologically opposed. So it was more of a convenience than a purposeful act. This organization had a plan to attack nations that he was ideologically opposed to, and all the PLO needed was a little bit of funding. Located in Ecuador, near the capital, Quito, is the so-called Volcano from Hell. It's a 15,000-foot stratovolcano that many people like to climb. Many of these hikers and climbers post their weekend adventures on Instagram. This couple were one of many who chose to post their adventure that day, and their names were Andrea Mazzetto and Sara Bragante. 
If you were to examine their Instagram, you'd observe that they seemed very close and seriously attached to each other. Many images on their Instagram are of many places that they've traveled together, and the volcano from hell was one of them. And like everywhere else that they've been together, they chose to document the entire adventure. One video was posted on their Instagram story showing them beginning to climb the mountain. Around 650 feet up, they chose to take a picture together. And that's where things go horribly wrong. You see, the moment after Andrea took this picture of him and his girlfriend together, 650 feet in the air, he slipped and tumbled down the mountain and died instantly. His girlfriend was powerless to stop anything. All she could do was shout for help and watch her boyfriend tumble and cascade down the mountain, hitting every sharp rock. Andrea was 30 years old and described as a hardworking and talented painter. His girlfriend would end up posting this image on their shared Instagram with the caption saying, Our cursed last photo together. You will always be with me, my little bear. This is Tonda Dickerson, and her background is relatively unknown. Like many people, she had a normal job. She was a waitress at a pretty popular restaurant, and one day, she was incredibly lucky. While doing her job, Apparently, she left a good impression, because at the end of her shift, she was handed something. A tip. But not any tip. It was a $10 million lottery ticket that another person had won earlier that day, and he felt that she deserved it. The man who won that ticket was named Edward Stewart, and the overall reasons as to why he gave it to her are unknown, but most people speculate he just felt generous that day and felt that she, because she was a waitress, deserved to have millions of dollars. She would get the ticket confirmed and claimed six days later and made the decision to have the money paid out to her over the course of 30 years. She would receive $375,000 a year. And I wish that's how the story ended. But of course, things are never that easy. The moment that her colleagues found out that she had been given $10 million, they felt that she should share that 10 million with all of them. So what did they do? They sued her with the hopes that the court system would force her to divide that money amongst four of her other waitresses. This would be a big story in Alabama for two reasons. The first being everyone's shock that a waitress was just handed $10 million for doing her job, and the second being that all of this took place at a Waffle House. Unfortunately, the Alabama court ruled against her. It took 45 minutes for both the judge and jury to decide that she had to share her winnings with four other waitresses that was working at Waffle House that day. Their argument being that she had went back into the kitchen with them, told them about the lottery ticket, and brokered some sort of deal to split the money with them. So before she left the court, the judge ordered her to forfeit $3 million so it could be split amongst the four waitresses that sued her. But she would end up being able to keep that money because after a couple of years, the Alabama Supreme Court overturned that decision, saying that the deal made in the kitchen counted as illegal gambling and the four waitresses had no claim to any of her money. While it might sound nice that Tonda is able to maintain all of the millions that she was given, her life quickly got even worse. She would be sued again, this time by the person who gave her the ticket, with the reason being that she had made some deal with him that he would buy her a new car if he had won the ticket. That was proven to be a lie, and that case was thrown out in court, and quickly after that court case, Tonda would be kidnapped at gunpoint by her ex-husband. His name was Stacy Martin, and he didn't allow Tonda to contact anyone, with the hopes that maybe he would be able to ransom her for some money. But the kidnapping didn't last that long. Tonda wasn't interested in being kidnapped or ransomed, so at the first opportunity that she could, she grabbed Stacy's gun and shot him through the chest, killing him. She would be rescued by the police and face no charges for this. So after being sued twice and forced to kill someone, Tonda was incredibly unhappy and burdened by this $10 million gift. And in the very moment she thought the worst of it was over, the Alabama state government came in to twist the knife, saying that she owed $1 million in gift taxes for being given $10 million by a stranger. This was on top of her income tax because technically she was earning $375,000 a year at that point. 
but because she barely had enough money to cover the income tax from her gifted lottery ticket on top of not having $1 million at all, the state government decided to just take $1 million out of her winnings to cover the tax obligation. As of now, she still has a bulk of her winnings, but she hasn't really spent much of it. She's passed off most of that money to her husband and her children and is currently working at a casino. This story really hammers home that no good deed goes unpunished. Imagine the worst thing that could happen after or around Christmas Day. I know I and many others associate that holiday with pure joy and happiness, and to think of anything negative happening on or around the holiday would just be devastating. And that would be the unfortunate reality for Aaron Ham, because two weeks later, after Christmas of 1992, his mother would go missing. It would be on the night of January 6th, 1993, when Bonnie Ham decided to finally leave her husband, Michael Ham. They had been having difficulties in the relationship, many of which seemed unfixable in Bonnie's perspective. So she chose to pack up all of her stuff and go to a motel. When the police were investigating her disappearance, there was evidence of her preparing to leave Michael well before January 6th. She already opened bank accounts in her name, started moving money into those bank accounts, and switched her mailing address to her work to hide the fact that she was doing all of this. The only thing left for her to do was to leave and officially divorce Michael. But unfortunately, she never had the opportunity. The next morning, neither Bonnie nor Michael showed up at work. Many of her co-workers and close friends decided to call the police. And when the police were trying to retrace her steps, they found her purse buried around five miles away from her home, not in dirt, but in a dumpster. And all of her valuables and possessions were still in the purse. So police immediately ruled out robbery and assumed the worst, that someone was trying to hide foul play, that someone was trying to make it hard for the police to identify Bonnie if she popped up anywhere. Like most criminal cases that involve someone who is currently in a relationship with somebody else, the first person that they looked at was Michael. He apparently insisted from the start that he was not involved in his wife's disappearance, which was strange because the only people who knew that anything was wrong was the police. But there was no evidence and Michael had an alibi. He was gone approximately 45 minutes during the time where Bonnie left for the motel and somebody disposing of her handbag in a dumpster. The person corroborating this alibi was his mother, who he apparently been on the phone with during the time where he supposedly would have been throwing away Bonnie's handbag. Problem is, the detective didn't believe Michael, and instead of abandoning the lead, he took what Michael said about Bonnie going to the motel. So when he went there, he of course found it, her car. She never left. And when they went inside of the room that she rented, almost everything that she left the house with was still there. And once they started investigating the car, they found a giant dirty boot print on the floor of the driver's side. Yes, Bonnie supposedly was driving with dirty boots on. The detective immediately took a picture of this boot print, thinking that it would absolutely point back to Michael, or at the least point to whoever knew of Bonnie's whereabouts. But unfortunately, Michael's boots were never investigated. The reason being is that Bonnie's father thought that it had no significance. He had this to say, if it is his footprint, I'm not sure if it means anything. My footprint is in my wife's car. That doesn't mean I have ever done any harm to my wife. This statement and the lack of any other evidence threw a wrench in the police department's investigation. Detective Hinson didn't give up though. He had one more lead that he hadn't investigated yet, Michael and Bonnie's child. He arranged to have Aaron see a child psychologist about what happened the night before Bonnie left. And Aaron had this to say, Daddy hurt her, and then he would, in the best of his ability, go into detail about how he saw his father strike his mom and bury her in the backyard. But because this was a child's testimony, the judge didn't take it seriously. So as a result, the case went cold. Aaron Ham would be sent to live with a new family, who gave him a new last name, Frazier. And he would live as Aaron Frazier for the rest of his childhood, all the way up to his adulthood. But he could never forget his past. He could never forget the potential reality that his mother is buried in the backyard of his childhood home and that his dad was responsible for her murder. So he purchased the home. He wanted to rent it out and he wanted to fix it up. 
but also find some closure for some serious childhood trauma. So with some help, he was able to start digging in the backyard with the hopes of installing a pool. Most of the backyard was covered in concrete, so Aaron and his brother-in-law rented an excavator and a jackhammer to break up the concrete. After removing all of the loose concrete, they started digging in the backyard, marking a space for the pool. In the process, they accidentally broke a water pipe, adding one more thing to the list of things that need to be repaired at this old property. Both he and his brother-in-law fumbled around in the dirt looking for the pipe when they found a plastic bag, or possibly a thick plastic sheeting material. It was really odd, because whatever it was, was buried relatively shallow, but they needed to remove it anyway. The pool had to go there, so Aaron started tugging at the plastic, trying to rip it out of the ground, and he ended up ripping it open, which would be fine if he didn't find what looked like a coconut, or what he thought was a coconut at first, until he turned the coconut over and saw it had eye sockets and teeth. He had found his mother. Everything that happened next happened very quickly. Aaron called his wife and told him what he found, and then he called the detective who he was working with all those years ago to find out what happened to his mom. His father, Michael Ham, would be found in the area. He wasn't hiding, he didn't change his name, he genuinely thought that he got away with it, and over a course of a couple of weeks, he was found guilty of murder and sent to prison. Living in the modern world comes with a lot of perks. If you live in a developed nation, you never have to worry about where your food's coming from, access to energy of any type, and most certainly, the likelihood of you dying from a disease is incredibly low, but it's not zero. It's not impossible that someone living in the United States or the United Kingdom to catch mumps or measles. It's happened. It just doesn't happen as much as it used to, with the reason being, that we've done a very good job of eradicating some of the craziest diseases that humanity has been fighting against since the beginning of time. As long as you take the proper precautions, you will never ever be infected with polio, mumps, measles, rubella, smallpox, the list goes on. And today, I wanna to talk about a disease that recently joined that list of ones that have been completely eradicated or are functionally eradicated. That disease being rabies. Rabies is a viral disease that causes encephalitis in humans and other mammals. And that encephalitis is what I wanna talk about today. You see, encephalitis is the inflammation of the brain. And that brain inflammation has a very, very strange effect on mammal behavior. Rabbit animals don't eat. They don't drink. When encountering other animals, they aren't fearful. They almost have this insatiable need to attack or at the least linger around other unaffected animals with the theory being that the rabies virus kinda has a mind control aspect on those who are infected. A mammal that doesn't drink collects saliva in its mouth. And if you study the saliva of those who have rabies, you'll find nothing but the virus. An animal that lunges at others and attacks others helps spread the disease through bites. And an animal that doesn't eat dies and becomes infected carrion for decomposers. When a human contracts rabies, it first presents itself as a mild fever. And that fever doesn't come within the first few days of a bite. Sometimes it might present itself after a month. That's why many people say that if you are bitten by any creature, especially a mammal, you must get the rabies vaccine. Otherwise, you might not show symptoms until it's too late. Many doctors associate the first signs of rabies with almost a death sentence. Once you're showing signs of rabid behavior and hydrophobia, the likelihood of death is nearly certain. And to the keen listeners out there, you might have heard me say that rabies makes you not drink. And yes, this is a classic sign of the infection. Hydrophobia is incredibly important for rabies transmission because the virus wants to collect inside of your mouth and washing your mouth out with water or swallowing the virus is counter to its motives. And seeing this present itself in humans is incredibly eerie and the textbook definition of abnormal now, how does the phobia present itself? What could prevent someone from drinking water? Well, somehow the rabies virus can take over your throat muscles and salivary glands. Once you start drinking water, your throat begins to violently spasm, and the pain is so excruciating that the person who's suffering with hydrophobia will associate water with that pain and subconsciously stay away from it. And for those out there who think that they could just tank the pain, 
the overproduction of saliva makes it almost impossible for you to swallow. And this happens every single time you pick up a cup of water, reinforcing the pain and reinforcing the fear. There are many videos like this one on the internet of people attempting to demonstrate what hydrophobia is, and I don't think it will ever not be eerie. And the fact that there's still tens of thousands of people on this planet suffering in this way is incredibly concerning, but also a testament to human willpower and ingenuity. Because there was a time where if you were to encounter a stray dog and that dog were to bite you, you would spend the next month incredibly feverish, afraid of water, and slowly dying. What's up everyone, it's your boy Aileris, and I hope you enjoyed today's newest installment of the Morbid Reality series. You're going to get a whole bunch more this weekend, so stay tuned. I know it's been a long wait. For those who are unaware, it has been an uphill battle working with YouTube this week. But it seems like your boy has finally cracked the code and has been able to produce some content that everybody on his channel can see. And at the end of the day, that's what's important. I don't want any of you guys to have trouble watching my content, man. Especially if you've been waiting for three weeks. I can't thank you guys enough for your patience. And as always, we gotta thank the Patreon supporters that make content like this possible. A big thank you to Tariq, D, The Blurred Star, Mr. Sandman, Mike, Sleepy Dragon, Power Lover, Loving Tate, Tron Destroy 23, Co Connor Purvis, S16, My Golden Experience, James Tucker, BMX30, Cinnamon Sticks, Scott, The Fake Musician, Buckethead, Samantha Bellhart, Admin Faneker, Bloody Hunter, Keely, Dundernass Hawk, Swiss Patreon user, and Noah, thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated, and if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description, one of my merch store and one of my Patreon. Both funds go directly into the channel so we can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.